Good morning, this is News Desk. Within the next 60 minutes, we will look at Nagrat's call on government to ensure the timely release of resources for the smooth implementation of the free senior high school policy. President of the association, Christian Adaipoku, will join us in studio. Also, managers of private second cycle institutions recommend partnership with government before implementation of the free SHS policy. And later, appointments committee is set to begin vetting original ministers today. We'll take you live to Parliament. Stay with us. Remember all these stories plus business and sports coming up in the next one hour. Don't go away. My name is Beatrice Edu. Thank you for joining us. Free textbooks, free meals in addition to free tuition fees have been some of the main focal points for President Akufuado's free senior high school policy. The free SHS program dominated almost all his campaign messages throughout the electioneering period. And now it's here. Mr. Akufuado says this policy would be implemented from September this year. Parents and education unions alike have welcomed the policy. We'll have a conversation shortly with the president of the National Association of Graduate Teachers, Christian Adaipoku. But here's President Akufuado when he spoke at the celebration of Okuyapeman Senior High School at Okuyapem in the Eastern Region. The government of Ghana will fund the cost of public senior high schools for all those who qualify for entry from the 2017-2018 academic year onwards. By free SHS, we mean that in addition to tuition, which is already free, there will be no admission fees, no library fees, no science center fees, no computer lab fees, no examination fees, no utility fees. There will be free textbooks, free boarding, and free meals. Free SHS will also cover agricultural, vocational, and technical institutions. And as I promised you, Christian Adaipoko is in the studio with me. He's the president of Nagrat, and uh, he's here to discuss this, uh, this policy with us. Good morning to you, sir. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Beatrice, for having me here. So first of all, I know that uh, Nagrat has already welcomed this policy. But for you, as in for Nagrat, how do you think this would improve the quality of education? Well, the first thing is that um, we think that it is so uh, heartwarming that every Ghanaian child in the nooks and crannies of this country will have the opportunity of not terminating their education at the basic level, but have the chance to also enjoy uh, secondary education. We think that um, insofar as government is going to take over the funding of education all through and through, the burden of having to send students away chasing them to go and bring school fees and other things will be things of the past. That means students will have the chance to concentrate, steady, and then um, be able to execute uh, every assignment that they are given in the school and be able to pass and then help us build a quality nation. But just to add, though, I know that you've also cautioned the government in the implementation of this policy. How exactly? Yes, uh, history is guiding us, and that is why we are calling on the president to be mindful of some of the challenges we have had with the implementation of such similar um, programs. A typical example is the uh, capitation grant. When it was introduced, the first one year, it was timeless. Everybody hailed it. But as time went on, at a point in time, we realized that um, sometimes schools open normally the first term is in September, but the capitation grant will be released in June, the ensuing year. 
that means it will be in arrears for nine good months. Um, it means it means that um, money that was supposed to have been used in September had to wait to be used in June. And that really didn't augur well for quality education. We also have the Northern Scholarship Scheme to guide us, where it has become an annual ritual that every year headmasters threaten to close down schools because um, government has either failed or delayed in releasing funds mm. for their operations. We have those who are on government scholarships, and we know how schools suffer to be able to get um, government subventions for them. Apart from this, we also have mandatory monies that government pays to every school. And in most cases, most of these things also delay. As we speak, uh, money for administration of schools and district offices have been in area since 2011. So if you look at all these things, you ask yourself whether uh, government thinks that headmasters and directors of schools are magicians who should be able to conjure money from somewhere mm. to be able to run schools in arrears while they wait for government at its own time to pay. Um, those are the things that work against quality education. So as government is going to roll out this policy, which we think is a very good idea, we also caution government that they should be mindful of the need to adhere to timeless release of funds mm. and educational resources, not only in the money, but also talk about textbooks, talk about workbooks, talk about um, teaching and learning materials, talk about teachers and the timeless payment of their salaries when they are recruited and so many others. And this actually leads me to my next question. But before that, just to refresh the memory of our viewers here, that under the, the capitation grant, which Mr. Adaipoku just spoke about, under this scheme, uh, public schools, basic schools in Ghana are entitled to receive 4.5 passwords, uh, 4 CDs, 50 passwords uh, per an enrolled pupil academic year to be used primarily for the running of the school and you talked about challenges with that but how do you think government can fund this initiative well um frankly speaking i don't know how the president is going to do that but what um, gives me the confidence is that it has been his pet program from 2012 the president has been trumpeting this um, free senior high school program and now that they have come into office I don't see how they're going to fail in their flagship program. But of course, I mean, you, you had concerns about learning from past experiences. You've quoted uh, providing money for schools in the northern region, as well as the capitation grant. And you've been in education for some years now. So you should certainly have some ideas regarding how you think government could support this financially. Yes. Um, first, let me say that those are challenges, and we see them as fuzzy edges to new programs. But uh, we also know that this is a, a government that has committed itself to a new program that it wants to execute to the latter. It tells us that um, even if it means using half of the nation's resources to achieve this, I think they are going to do it. And I don't think if they do that, it will be throwing money at bad at all. Because we all agree that education is the bedrock of the nation if you want to develop, you need a literate society to be able to develop well. And so if the government is going to prioritize education and pump in as many resources, suspend maybe construction of roads to make sure that everybody gets the level of education that is required for the nation to develop, I don't think it will be bad at all. Hold on, Mr. Daipoko, I'll come to you very shortly. But we know that managers of private second cycle institutions are also impressing on the government, actually recommending partnership with government before it rolls out its free senior high school policy. Here's a report on their concerns. Officials said taking into account the interest of private schools will give meaning to much touted public-private partnership for enhanced development. Joseph Donko is Ashanti Regional Vice Chairman of Private Schools Association. He welcomes government's commitment to making second cycle education free. He, however, tells Joy News some member schools are already out of business in what he describes as unfriendly environment. He is optimistic government intervention will save them from collapse. So even now, like I said, the private schools, most of them are not in existence. Why? Because they've collapsed, a lot of them. 
But we are looking at the new government promise of partnering the private sector. And if they are ready to work with the private sector, we believe we are all private sectors, and they will be able to work together, team up together for the betterment of the Ghanaian child, the betterment of Ghana. And that's what we are looking at. So it's not like we, we, are, we, we are thinking that no way the government is not going to listen to us. Definitely, once we are private sector, they'll listen to us, they'll give us the help, then we all part, uh, work, work together to make sure that the Ghanaian uh, benefits. Mr. Donko believes private schools have the capacity to create jobs by employing more teachers and non-teaching staff. They, they are not getting employment. We have the capacity to employ them. But the capacity comes in when we have more children. Getting more children, we will also look at the cutoff points. That at least the cutoff points should come down. If not 30, at least the 36 should be, should be there. So that if the children get 36 and they go to the public school, the rest should come to the private schools. That's why we also look. Donatian Sumensa, reporting for Joy News. So you heard some private managers there. Mr. Christian Adaipoku is still in the studio with me. First of all, what do you think of what they are asking government of? Well, it's difficult for me as a unionist in the position I sit. For us, we think that um, education should be the responsibility of the public system. And therefore, any attempt to try to privatize education, for us, we see it as um, an affront to the right to education because the private sector is in, they do edu business. What they do is they do business um, to make profit. And education is not meant for that. That notwithstanding, we also know that government alone cannot provide education. And so there's always the need to sit down with the private sector and then discuss and see how they can also fit in, such that it will not be like government pushing its responsibility to the private sector and then consequently denying people who will not be able to pay for it. For us, we see private sector as a, as a, as a couched place for the, hub, the hubs, those who can afford. Mm. And therefore, if they, have, they can afford, the private sector must make themselves so attractive beyond what the public can provide. In that case, they can attract people who want to spend more than government will want to spend. Do you think that this really breaks the monopoly of uh, private schools charging parents huge sums of money and so now then they will have to rethink how they deal with things, especially uh, or their financial you know, stuff? I don't think so. I think what they will bring on board is doing something extra than what government can provide. All over the world, private sector is encouraged to do that. And that means it, they don't give average education. They give more than the average. And so those who can afford more than what government can provide will then assess the private sector. And then those of us that cannot afford the, afford the private sector will remain with the public system. One of the challenges that some analysts believe could come with this free senior high school policy is the huge numbers of people who will be enrolled uh, who will go to senior high schools and therefore the government would have to you know think about infrastructure as well like expanding it how do you think government can deal with this concurrently providing all the freebies as well as dealing with infrastructure it's a bit challenging but um well it has come at a time that the nation has also invested so much in infrastructure already because if my memory serves me well the immediate past government indicated that they had commissioned about 70 um, new senior high schools and they have about 150 at various uh, levels of completion. So most of them are not yet populated to capacity. So some of these things will come in to fill the gap for now while government continues to explore other avenues to make sure that um, they expand facilities to create equity. Because the next question that comes up is, um, what about those in the boarding houses? Those who are day students will now crave to be boarders to, and the boarding facilities will not be able to accommodate all of them. Yes, that is true, but it is one of the challenges we are about to face at the beginning of the program. We will need to think through the modalities for even selecting people into the boarding houses mm. so that um, we create equity. Mm. And I recall that NAGRAT and some other education unions raised some issues during the transition period. Some were not made public, but specifically as regards the implementation of this policy, what were some of those issues you raised? The first issue we raised had to do with teacher recruitment. 
because as we all admit, the moment the program is rolled out, every parent whose child has been able to complete um, junior high school will then just pack the child's uh, materials and say, go to school. And the responsibility of paying for it is never the parent's responsibility again. So enrollment is going to soar. And as enrollment soars, it means teachers' responsibility will go up. You need more teachers to be able to um, uh, deliver the education to the children. And that means that government will have to recruit. So we have encouraged, we discussed it at the meeting that there will be the need for them to open up recruitment and recruit more teachers. And then also change the system whereby teachers are recruited and for one year they are not paid and so on. They should make sure that they put mechanism in place such that within the three months of their uh, recruitment, every teacher will be paid. And this hellabaloo that normally leads to agitations and um, strikes and so on will go down. We also discussed the issue of the entire three months arrears project that has caused a lot of problems for us that they should look at scrapping it off entirely and then um, instituting a new system that will be proactive enough to bring um, sanity into the system. Teacher motivation was also discussed and the president actually mentioned it. Um, we discussed housing for teachers, tax exemption for teachers to bring um, cars into the country for uh, the use for their use in executing their uh, duties as teachers. Um, we also discuss issues of quality, supervision, um, teachers' um, attitude to work, and so many things were discussed. And one major thing that also came out was the issue of WIAC um, uh, monopoly that is creating a whole lot of problems for us. Whatever they give us, whether they like, we like it or not, we take it. How exactly so, do you mean by whatever they give us, whether we like it or not, we have to take it? Over the past four years, we have never had any incident-free examination, whether at the BEC level or at the WASI level. And we have continuously made it clear that the world has gone beyond that. Almost every country in this world now has created some sort of competition to allow people to have a choice if the examiner is, or the examination body is not serving my interest well. Why should I be conscripted to the abosom, whether I like it or not? No. I'm still wondering how you, what you mean exactly by if they are not serving your interests well. How is WIAC not serving teachers' uh, interests? The, the, the leakage of not teachers' interests, but the interest of the certificate they give, that is the students, parents, and every stakeholder in education, the interest of everybody. By allowing examination to leak, and then bringing the integrity of the examination to question. You think WIAC allows that? Who should we blame? You are supposed to protect the integrity of the examination. But it's, it's a chain. They talk about police officers who have to escort people, you know, sending the exams papers and some other, you know, intermediary personnel that they hire. So why would you blame WIAC alone in this? You said they hired them. So they, throughout the chain, they have the final authority in whatever happens. And therefore, every responsibility comes to their doorstep. They take the security steps. They are supposed to study best practices across the globe and then take certain decisions that will help protect the integrity of our examination. And they are not doing that. We don't see these things happening in most of the advanced countries. Why are they doing it well and we cannot do it well? It means somebody is complacent. He thinks that whether they protect the integrity or not. We don't have any other choice but to take them. So for you, what is that major decision you think could be made to change how things are done at work? Well, um, I'm not an expert there. But what I know is that in most countries, they give the options. They can have three, four, five examination bodies, all regulated by a superintending regulatory body. And that means they ensure quality. There is quality assurance system in place to make sure that you all measure up to the standard. Just like the universities, there is a national accreditation board that goes around to check quality assurance. If you don't meet the standard, they can even close you down. But who can close WIAC down in this country as we speak right now? Because they are the only ones we have. Would you recommend that there are other examination bodies, for instance? Yes. So uh, I was not surprised that in parliament, the minister made a pronouncement that we are thinking of breaking the monopoly of WIAC because it was discussed at the and meeting. And how will that work? It's going to work. We, we are afraid because we think WIAC is indispensable and whatever we do, we cannot do away with them. Not necessarily, but, not but if you have, let's say, two or three examination bodies, who is doing what at what time? 
wouldn't there be conflicting responsibilities at or all. you know duplication of responsibilities at all there wouldn't be because they all set their examinations based on the standard that will be set up by the superintending body so you work within that standard and then you make sure that the integrity of your examination is protected because if it's not protected nobody will register with you so if i get you correctly maybe wire could be in charge of senior high school exams not then at all. another you can, could be in charge of senior high school alone you can have three different bodies issuing different certificates at the senior high school level each of them admissible at the university or any other institution mm. because if you go to the uk for instance the gc we have the cambridge certificate there they have it you have um, oxford having their own we have gcec and many, many other institutions that, that examine the same level of examination for everybody. And then um, each of the certificates is recognizable. I want to come back to the welfare of the teachers because you're looking at numbers and how teachers look at all these children I have to teach and at the end of the day, what do I gain from it? You talked about cars, you talked about remuneration and others, but for the teachers, what would you say are the priority areas that government must look at in the implementation of this free senior high school policy? Uh, in measuring quality, there are three cardinal things we look at. Quality teachers, quality tools, and quality environment. And the quality teachers means, one, a well-trained and retrainable teacher. What it means is that after going through the normal training to, be, be, to become a teacher, to be certificated, from time to time, the system must train you because the world continues to change. There are teachers who were trained in the 1970s and 80s, and they are still in the system. At that time, there was nothing like computer. Today, the little kid in uh, kindergarten one can even operate the computer. And so if the teacher does not also retrain himself, he will not be able to live, I mean, I mean be abreast of time. And so there is the need to constantly retrain teachers, give them in-service training and others. It is cardinal. Professional integrity is protected when these things are done. And we don't normally see this happening in Ghana. And so teachers continue to give us the old stuff that they, they are used to. That's not right. So, so if I went to school in 1998, I can be assured that if my child is going in 2012, I can give my notes to the child. If you don't Probably. think it can happen. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of things might have changed. Maybe at the university level, new ones have been trained and things might have changed. But what I'm trying to say is a lot of us, those things that we were given at the university or at the training colleges are the things we continue to give out with little adjustment that we read and get to add. But there are technical ways of retraining teachers because new things continue to happen every day. New researches are coming out, and we need to abreast ourselves of the modern ways of teaching. And that means teachers must be continuously retrained. If you go to UK, for instance, uh, every month they have one, year for uh, one day for teachers that they sit down, they do in-service training, discuss new method, methodology, and so on that helps the system. During vacation, teachers don't just go and rest. You have in-service training for them, vacation classes to abreast teachers of modern ways. That is what we want to see in Ghana. Teachers want to enjoy their work, but we can only enjoy the work when we have the skills to be able to deliver and not always stick into the old way. Because the topic I have been teaching for the, the past five years, whether I prepare or not, the moment I step in the classroom, I can still teach it because it's the same stuff. But if new ways are coming, then it means every day I must upgrade myself. Else, even the children in the class will challenge me. That's what we want to see. It's one of the issues. It's not only about the money, but also about training us. Not our cost, at our cost, but at the, at the cost of the system. Because if the teacher is well trained, he gives out his best and he helps the system to move on. Your final words, Mr. Daikoku. Well, I want to first uh, encourage and commend Nana for the bold step that he has taken. Yesterday, a woman who sells um, a fried yam at the wayside that I know called me yesterday and said, she's so happy that the president is going to come out with this thing because she had set up, um, I mean, um, 750 Ghana cities that she was going to use to pay the child's school fees the next term. And now that the president has uh, announced this, she is going to put that in her business. And that tells us that at the grassroots, there are many people who are sacrificing and are suffering. And these are the people that the president's policy is meant for. So we commend him, and we believe that he'll be able to do it. We want him to succeed.
Thank you very much, Mr. Christian Adaipoku, for joining us in the studio. And happy birthday to you. Thank you very much. <laughs> and Christian Adaipoku is the president of Nagrat, and he's been sharing some thoughts with us here on the free senior high school policy introduced by the president, Nana Adudankwa Kofuado. You're also watching News Desk on Journey. Stay with us. We'll be back very shortly with more stories. Don't go away.